Take your Bibles this morning, turn with me, first to First Chronicles 29, we'll get there in just a second. This morning I want to talk to you about uh, how we deal with un economic uncertainty when we're living in very, very tumultuous and uncertain times. We know that inf inflation has played a big role in our finances over the last few years. Think about the price of gas and how it's increased. Actually, the number is 49%. That's shocking, isn't it? And then we look at uh, the cost of used cars, 37% they've went up. Groceries are up 21%. Rent is up 21%. Electricity, the power for your home is up almost 30%, 29.2%. We are living in tough economic times. But the scripture always has a word for us in those times. We're not the first generation to go through it, and we won't be the last should Jesus tarry. But we need to understand in those times, God has an answer and God has a plan. I find it interesting that the uh, politicians in D.C. would be quick to say to us, you just need to tighten your belt. You just need to cut back when they're not cutting back. Have you noticed that? Spend more and more and more and more. That's their philosophy. And that spending results in inflation that's out of control. We need to understand that God has a plan even when our leaders are not obeying him. Even when our leaders are not following him, God still has a plan. He has a plan for his people and a purpose for his church. And he will not stray from that. So I've come to tell you today, regardless of your economic situation, whether you have all you need and an abundance, whether you just have enough, or whether you're not quite there yet and you don't have enough, God has an answer for you. He has a plan for you. So we need to understand what God is saying to us. Now, some would say, well, now you're going to preach on prosperity. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm giving you biblical principles, how we understand kingdom finance. There's been a lot of pushback on prosperity teaching and for good reason. A lot of those teachers are living lavish lifestyles where the people supporting them are barely getting by. But I also know the only way to increase our faith enough for God to do his work in our life is through the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we need to understand that it reminds me of the family that went to church and on the way home, the dad just griped and complained about everything. It was too hot. The music was too loud. The preacher was too long. The seats weren't comfortable. I shouldn't have given anything in the offering, and they shouldn't ask me to. I love those kind of people. Because they come in, they sit in the, in the sanctuary, they soak up the air conditioning, they enjoy the seats, but they don't want to pay the bill. Interesting, isn't it? God has a plan for finances. On the way home, as this dad is complaining about everything at church, his little boy said, well, dad, it wasn't a bad show for a dollar. <laughs> Reveals the heart, doesn't it? And I'm not talking about the amount you give because Jesus gave us the parable of the, uh, the widow and the mite that she threw in, which was so minute compared to what the other folks were giving. But Jesus said because she didn't give from her abundance, but from her need, she gave more than all those who gave from their abundance. So I'm not talking about amounts today. I'm talking about kingdom principles. So let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 12. The scripture says, both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. Your hand is power and might, and in your hand is to make great and give strength to all. Psalm 3410 says, the young lions lack and suffer, suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Jeremiah 10, 23, let me back up a minute. Psalm 37, 19, both of these were written by David. Psalm 37, 19, David wrote these words for you and I to hang on to, to develop. He said, in the days of famine, you shall be satisfied. In hard times, God's going to meet your need when you operate by the principles of the kingdom of God. Jeremiah 10, 23, and I'm using the NET translation, New English. It says, Lord, we know what people do not control. We know people do not control their own destiny. It's not in their power to determine what will happen to them. So very, very true. And then Deuteronomy 8, 18 
Someone says, well, these are all Old Testament scriptures. Give me a minute. I'll get to the New Testament. We're going to tie it all together. Deuteronomy 8.18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. We made a covenant with God, right? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're grafted into the vine. We're a part of the family. And God will honor his covenant over us when we obey him and continue to live in that place of obedience. Now I want you to notice all those scriptures that I just read. Not one time does it say God gives us wealth. God gives us prosperity. God gives us finances. Not one time does it say that. It says he gives us the power. He gives us the power to gain the things we need to advance the kingdom of God. And whether you realize it or not, God is the source of your prosperity. God is the source of your blessing. If you have more than enough, then it's time to say, thank you God for being my source because all good things come from above. He is our source. Some say, oh, you don't understand. I worked hard for this money. That's my blood, sweat, and tears. Well, I would have to say, but who gave you the ability? I would have to say, but who opened the door for that opportunity? I would have to say, why are you in the position you're in where you can earn what you earn? It's all because God is our source. People try to claim it as their own, and I would have to say, for most of you in this room, what did you do? that caused you to be born in the United States of America, that caused you to live in one of the most prosperous times the world has ever known. Or in the case of Pastor Leo and Ama, what was in you, what did you do to open the door to immigrate from Ghana to the United States of America and to live in the blessing of the Lord? Come on somebody, get your mind wrapped around this. God is the source of your prosperity. God is the source of everything we have. Because truth, you could have been born in a third world country where you had to stand on the street and beg for your next meal. You could be living in a place where there, there are no economic opportunities, but God chose to put you right here. And for that, we need to give him honor and glory and praise. You see, we didn't give ourselves talent and abilities. God gave it to us. He is our source for everything. The talents and the abilities he gives us, we then have a responsibility to develop, to polish, to make them expert in our lives and to cause those things to work. But they were given by God. Remember this, God, we can't develop what God didn't give. We cannot develop what God didn't give. I mean, think about it. If the chemicals in your brain were just a little bit different, you could be a crazy, raving lunatic. You could be walking up the streets in Tallahassee talking to you some imaginary person that's not there and living out in the woods. God has blessed you. God has blessed me. He is the source of all our prosperity. I'm going to say it again. God is the source of our prosperity. The real asset in what God gives us is not dollars. It's not bank accounts. It's not retirement plans. The real asset, what God gives us, is not the house, the car, the clothes, the tangible things. The real asset that God gives us is his favor on our lives. God's favor on our lives. Favor can sometimes also be translated grace. In other words, God giving us what we don't deserve. I assure you, there isn't a person in this room that deserves to be in the United States of America, that deserves to be in the middle class or the upper class. Not a person. But when we understand our God is our source, then we're able to surrender to him. And at that point, we're no longer a reservoir, we're a river. And everything God gives to us flows through our hand to be a blessing, and I'm getting ahead of myself, to be a blessing to someone else. God's not looking for reservoirs. He's looking for people who will say, God, as you bless me, I will use that blessing to bless someone else. Many Christians have fell into the trap of measuring prosperity by the amount of money in their bank account. 
But being prosperous isn't about money. It's about relying on God as your source. You, I've been in the third world. I've talked to people that didn't have two pennies to rub together. They barely had enough money to feed their family and put a roof over their head. But you know what? They weren't griping and complaining because they knew God is their source. You know, there's a principle. It's called redemptive lift. That when you come to Jesus Christ, no matter where you live, things are going to fall off of your life that are costing you money. And things are going to come into your life that have great value. And redemptive lift, because of Jesus, elevates you from where you were to where God intends you to be, regardless of where you live. Come on, folks. I'm looking at some in this room today. You spent tens of thousands of dollars on substances that destroy your life and your body. But when you came to Christ, those chains fell off. You were transformed. You were changed. Those things are gone. They're no longer a part of who you are because God put his favor upon you. Some people say, well, you know, I just, I just don't get that principle because I barely have enough money to get by. You know what I'd say to you? Take a look at what you're spending money on. If you're spending money on things that destroy your life, your mind, your soul, your body, stop it and start investing in God's kingdom. The real asset is the favor of God, not money. Money is a byproduct of God's favor. I'm going to say that again. You didn't catch it. Money is a byproduct of God's favor on your life. And God does amazing things with us. When we choose to obey his principles. Now you say to me, well, I know people who are prospering and they don't serve God. I do too. But I also see the mess that's in their lives. I see the heartache, the hurt, the destruction, the devastation, the marriage falling apart, the kids in total rebellion. I see all these things that they strive for that actually don't bring satisfaction into their lives. Paul talked about it when he wrote 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful, harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Wow, did you hear that? When your main goal, when your desire is to be rich, to have more, then you fall into temptation and a snare that leads you to destruction and perdition. Verse 10 says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not just evil, all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You want to come to a place of peace in God? Then recognize God as your source. Recognize God as the one who supplies everything for you and to you. And if we prosper God's way, then we have God's promise. And what does Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22 tell us? It says, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow with it. So I would say to you today, yes, you can have things. Yes, you can have money. Yes, you can be in a position of, of wealth. But when you come to it God's way, then you're not going to have the turmoil, the destruction, the heartache that rages those who didn't come to it God's way. Thank you. Get that in your spirit and get it in your heart. Prosperity is recognizing we are stewards of God's finances. It's not mine, it's his. How can I hold it with a clenched fist and declare this is mine, not yours? Let me tell you something. If you live like a miser, let me rephrase that. If you give like a miser, you will live like a miser. Let me say it again. If you give like a miser, you'll live like a miser. God has a plan for your life. The world tells you that you're the owner, but God tells you you're the steward. And there's a huge difference in those two things. God says when you see your blessing as a stewardship, then I will bless you. I will prosper you. And I will meet every need represented in your life. You say, well, that sounds too good to be true. That's why you aren't doing it. Because you think it sounds too good to be true. You know what God said? Test me. Try me. Let me prove to you that I am true, that I am real, and that my word always prevails. 
God has a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11, most of you know it. For I know the plans I have towards you, says the Lord. They are plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. That's the prosperity of God. When we live as a steward rather than as an owner. And when God is our source, we know he will supply every need. Why do we know that? Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. We know he will because he's promised that he will. But it won't be according to the world's economy or the world's standard. See, the world's economy is always subject to depressions and recessions. You can look back over the history of America and the stock exchange, and you can see that about every seven years, there is a correction in the stock market. Things that have gotten too high, and that correction brings them down again. We call it a recession. Now, I don't really think anybody's here that lived through the Great Depression, but my dad did, and his dad did, and I know the stories. And I understand that in those times it was difficult. Matter of fact, my dad, his family, they went to California. They were called Okies. It was a term of derision. And they stayed out there for several years until they were able to go back to the farm. And the rains came and they were able to start working the farms again and producing income as they produced crops. But they understood that even in that time of difficulty, God still supplied their needs. God was still the source we need to understand your needs are supplied not according to the world's economy, but according to God's economy. And God's economy is always stable. It doesn't undergo recessions and depressions. God's economy is always <clears throat> on keel and on line with what we need. Never forget the story of the little old lady who didn't have much. She was like a social security pensioner and didn't have much money. And she would always pray that God would give her groceries or the money to grow groceries. She prayed with her windows open. Her neighbor was an atheist. He got absolutely sick and tired of hearing her pray, God supply my need. So one day he thought, I'm gonna get her. And he went and bought a big old sack full of groceries, set it on her front porch, knocked on the door and took off running. When she came to the door, she began praising God because her need had been met. He couldn't resist. He came back over to her and he said, yeah, but you understand God didn't give you that. I gave you that. And she threw up her hands and said, well, praise God that God can even use the devil to supply my needs. Come on, somebody. God is good and he has various means and ways of supplying our need. Stewards are those who see themselves as accountable for what God has trusted to them. Let me say that again. If you're a steward, you see yourself as accountable to God for what God has entrusted to you. Because we understand he blesses us so that can flow through our lives. Trusting God in the area of finances is a baby step of faith. I mean, think about it for a minute. When you're a new believer, a new Christian, it was difficult perhaps for you to given to the kingdom of God because you didn't understand how everything worked. But when you began to obey the commands of God and the promises of God, it was amazing how God unfolded and opened to you a better job, a better position, a raise where you're at, a lower house payment. On and on I could go because God is the owner and we're the stewards. Luke 16, 10. Jesus was giving the parable of the unfaithful manager. And he concluded that by saying, he that is faithful in that which is the least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust in much. If there, you therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? What's he saying? He's saying, if you haven't been faithful to me with what I've already given you, how can I trust you with eternal riches? How can I trust you with the promises and the, and the hope that you have in me? If you can't be faithful in the little, which is money, how can you be faithful which, with much, which is eternal blessings, God's supply? See, if he can't trust us with the money we have now that he's already given us, then he can't trust us with eternal riches. It's just that simple. And I don't know about you, but I determined a long time ago 
I'm not going to be standing on the streets of heaven wearing a pauper's crown when I could be standing on the streets of heaven wearing a crown of victory, a crown of life, given a position in the kingdom to rule. Oh, come on, somebody. When we're faithful with the little, he makes us faithful with the much. Some people, maybe in this room, maybe online, maybe you'll watch later, some people live below kingdom standards because they never develop their faith in the area of finances. They never turned loose. They never got the principle that you're a steward. God is the supply. Everything we own are from God. Listen, I'm not telling you that you can give your way into getting. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there may be times in our life when we don't see the full manifestation of every promise and every gift of God because we have served him with a clenched fist and refused to allow his blessings to flow through our life. If you can't be faithful in the little, how will you be faithful with the much? You said, I don't understand. What do you mean? Well, let me tell you a story. I knew a man years ago who came to the church and got saved. He just couldn't wrap his head around giving to the kingdom of God. He just couldn't imagine why that was needed or necessary. He did not understand. And then one day, he got sick. And he said, come pray for me. I want to be healed. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. He was never healed. Why? Because he never took a baby step that opened the riches of the kingdom of God. Well, you're saying that we need to buy the gifts of God. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. Don't you go there. What I'm saying is when we choose to obey God with what is most precious in our life, our finances, then God opens the door, opens the window, and pours out upon us blessings which cannot be contained in every area and every facet of our lives. So if you understand financial stewardship, it enables you to be a blessing to others. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 10, the Bible says, But this I say, Paul writing, He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Did you catch that? As he purpose in his heart. Giving is a deliberate thing. Giving is a measured thing. Giving is something we decide before we ever walk through the door, before we ever sign on to the church app, before we ever write a check or fill out an offering envelope. It is a very deliberate thing. And what we're doing, we're saying, God, everything I have is yours, and here's what I want to offer back to you. I made the decision. I'm going to honor you with my income and my increase, and the kingdom can be magnified. Verse 7, every man according as he purposes in his heart, let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Hmm. A cheerful giver. I, I'm here to tell you, we love our worship. But I'm convinced when we are giving, it should be one of the most exciting times in the service. We should be laughing and smiling and be happy because I'm releasing so God can bless me again. So I can release again so God can bless me again. So I can, do you hear what I'm saying? It's a cycle that happens in the kingdom of God. Look at verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things. Did you hear that? All sufficiency in all things. All sufficiency in all things. What is he withholding? Nothing. What is he promising? All sufficiency in all things. May abound to every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He's given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. In verse 10, I love it. Now he that ministers seed to the sower will minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. I don't know about you, but I want some more righteous fruit following me. I want some more righteous fruit ahead of me. And every time I determine to sow into the kingdom of God, God says he will minister more seed so I can continue to sow and it will be a blessing not only to others, but to me. Wow, what a principle. 
I know there's some of you sitting there thinking every time I come to church, he talks about money. Well, you should come more often. <laughs> Don't come once every year or once every 10 years. Be faithful every Sunday and Wednesday and you'll hear other things. But if you're here again and I'm talking about the finances of the kingdom, then it may be that's what God is trying to get your attention about. Maybe you need to sit up and take notice. Instead of griping and groaning and complaining, all the church wants is my money. I got news for you. We don't want your money. We do not want your money. I want to see you obey God. That's all I'm interested in. Will you obey God? Because when you obey God, all this other stuff falls into place and comes into clear, sharp focus. See, the reason God makes grace abound towards you is so that you will abound to give to every good work. The real motive behind God's kingdom principles of finance is not to get, but it's to give. And that's critical. That's critical. If you don't give to the kingdom of God, why do you sit there expecting every blessing from God? Say, so, oh, but you're, you're saying I have, to, I have to give in order to see God do things in my life. No, I'm not. I'm saying that when you're obedient to Christ, when he has forgiven of your sins and changed your life and broke off all those nasty habits and addictions, there will be a desire in your heart to do something that you've never done before, to take that baby step of faith and begin giving into the kingdom of God. You say, well, you know, you make too much money, preacher. This church costs us too much money. The electricity is too high. Well, I, I, I've got a solution to all that. We fire me. We meet under a tree, and you don't have to give a dime. How about that? There's a solution to your problem. I'll offer it to you. Oh, no, no, no. We want air conditioning. We want electricity. Well, then get over yourself and obey the kingdom of God and the principles of God's kingdom. The real motive behind the blessing of God should never be to get. It should always be to give. Many people reject the principles of biblical prosperity and giving because they see it as selfish or greedy. I've heard so many people say, hey, I've got enough. I'm okay. I don't want to be rich. I have a roof over my head, my basic needs covered. I don't want or need any more. May I tell you that is the real selfish attitude. Because all you're saying is, God has given me all I need. I don't need to be able to bless anybody else. I'm content here in my own little world. And as long as you continue to live in your own little world, you'll never see the great world that God has in store for you. It's a thinking that says, I've got enough. Forget everybody else. And that is a selfish attitude. Why do we need to understand the principles of the kingdom of God? Because when we do and practice them, then it releases prosperity into our life. And I'm just not talking about money. I'm talking about peace and joy and contentment and faithfulness and goodness. Oh, I'm talking about the fact that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Oh, somebody hear me. I'm talking about the God who said, I lifted you up out of the pit and set your feet on the rock to stay. I'm talking about the God who's made promise after promise after promise. And when we engage through obedience, it throws open the door for all those things to pour into our lives. The Lord told Abraham in Genesis 12 too, he would make him a blessing so he could be a blessing. Let me read it to you. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. He said, when I bless you, you're gonna bless somebody else. When I bless you, you're going to bless the nations. When I bless you, you're going to bless those around you. Oh, come on, folks. Blessing from God isn't just for us. It flows through us to be a blessing to somebody else. You might want to remember this one. You and I will never fulfill the purpose of God in our life. without receiving his blessing. We'll never fulfill it. It's impossible because the kingdom of God is not flesh and blood, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We'll never fulfill it without receiving the blessing of God in our lives. Let me say it a different way. God's kingdom cannot advance without people prospering. 
people giving. People allowing resources to flow through their life. We need this revelation. We're all about us. No, we need to all be all about the kingdom. And we need to say every week, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to give? People tell me all the time, tithing is an Old Testament principle. I'm not talking about tithing. I'm talking about giving. Those are two very different things. See, I believe givers will far exceed that 10%. I believe people who are blessed by God and living in the blessing of God will want to bless others and then financial means don't become so, become so critical to them or they don't hold it so tightly, but they see what God will do and they allow him to bless others through them. God's kingdom cannot advance without God's people prospering. We need to know how to prosper God's way. Do you realize that Jesus taught more about money than heaven and hell? Yeah, he did. Read the New Testament, you'll see it. Don't take my word for it. That's why he said in Luke 16, 10 and 11, the scripture we just read, that if we can't be trusted with the little, how can he trust us with eternal riches? Verse 13 of uh, Luke chapter 16, he went on to say, you can't serve two masters. You will either love the one and hate the other, or you'll hate the one and love the other. He said, you cannot serve both God and mammon. And mammon is an old word that simply means money. You can't serve both. Which are you going to serve? Who are you going to serve? And the last, he teaches us a principle of the storehouse from his kingdom. Deuteronomy 28.8, the Lord will command a blessing on you in your storehouses and in all for which you set your hand. He'll bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving to you. Think about that word, storehouses. I can't tell you how many times I've had preachers say, bring all your tithe into the storehouse. Let me make this personal. He's talking to you and me. What is your storehouse? Do you have a storehouse? God can't bless what you don't have. But he said, I will bless the storehouses. I will command the blessing in your storehouses. So what's your storehouse? The church, we have a storehouse, all nations, because we know we have a future. We know that future requires money. So we're saving, we're putting into that storehouse every week, every month, so that when that time arrives for us to take to our next, there'll be funds there to do it. See, it's a storehouse, and God blesses the storehouse. However, on a personal level, a large majority of Christians don't have a storehouse. But what's a storehouse? It's a savings account, folks. It's something you put into regularly for God to bless. We need to understand God wants to bless us in our storehouse. But if we never have a storehouse, if we never set anything back, what's God going to bless Poverty doesn't make you pious. It doesn't make you righteous or holy. It makes you poor. And God wants to bless you in your storehouse. You say, well, I'm barely getting by. Well, start small and dream big. You've heard that before. Put a dollar a week in your storehouse. Heard some crazy politicians say that if you give a dollar a week at the end of the year, you'll have $10,000. That's nuts. No, you'll have $365 and a little bit of change. It's amazing what they think people should believe. That's absolutely idiotic. But if we don't have a storehouse, how is God going to command the blessing on it? So I'm encouraging you right now, today, no matter where you're at, what you have, what you don't have, set up a storehouse. Begin putting money into it every week. And at the same time, focus on retiring all your debt. I'm serious. We're living at a time where debt's going to be a real curse in and over people's lives. Retire it, get rid of it. Well, how we do it? Well, Kareem and Katura, Kareem's up there on the camera, are going to teach another course on financial peace and show you, teach you how to do that very thing. Get out of debt and get out of debt quickly. Come on, folks. We want to help you. We want to encourage you. Set up a storehouse, eliminate your debt, and let God bless it. Most Christians have learned to give or to pay God. Most Christians pay their bills, but what they don't do 
is pay themselves. They don't have a storehouse. Set up a storehouse. God can only bless what you have. He cannot bless what you don't have. He cannot bless what you need. I guarantee you, Tom, would you come back? I guarantee you this morning that more than anything, God wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you. God wants to make his face shine up on you. And when we choose to honor God with our finances according to biblical principles, then it unlocks the door that allows the blessing of God to flow through our life in a mighty and in a wonderful way. Can I tell you this? God will take better care of you accidentally than you'll ever take care of yourself on purpose. You need to think about that. Because when we're his children, that's his job. That's what he's promised. And I can declare, and he shall supply every need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Thought about taking the offering at the end this morning. And I thought, now, some will just see that as manipulation. I'm not going to do it. But I will challenge you. If you're living like a miser, open that fist and let God bless you and start to give and see what God will do in your life. If you're stressed, if you're worried, if you're distraught over finances, isn't it time to trust God? Isn't it time to do something different? Because what you have been doing obviously doesn't work. And you know the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. If we don't obey the Lord's commands and promises, the outcome's gonna stay the same. See, both the spiritual and the practical must be working together for you and I to live in the favor of God. Stand to your feet with me today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Whether you're in the overflow, the balcony, online, or down here in the sanctuary, it doesn't matter. I've got a challenge for you today. And if you're here and you say, I need some help with my finances. I need to learn to trust God for more than I've trusted Him before. I want to be that river that releases the blessing of God rather than the reservoir that keeps it shut up and locked away. That's the invitation. Very simple. If that's you, you're going to raise your hand and say, pray for me. And I'm going to pray for you every day. I'll put your name on my list and I'll lift you before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and I will pray for you every single day. In the overflow, do the same thing. Lift your hand and say, Lord, help me. Yes, yes, others. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each one of these individuals, young and old alike, who said, I want to live by the principles of the kingdom of God. I want to trust you. Even if it's just a dollar a week, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give from my need, not from my abundance, and I'm going to see you do great things in my life. Lord, bless your people today. Bless your people. Release your favor upon them. For the blessing of the Lord makes us rich and adds no sorrow with it. And as the scripture says, may he bless you according to how your soul prospers. Get it right in the spirit. Practice the things practically and you'll see the gate of God's blessing thrown open wide before you. Been so many times in our life, Yvonne and I, is when we've, we've not known what was going to happen next or when the finances would be supplied. But we never say we don't have the money. We, we never say we can't afford it. We say when God supplies. You gotta change your thinking, folks. Change your thinking from this is mine to it's all God's. He's my source, and He supplies. And if you'll adopt that philosophy, you know what it does? It moves all the worry out of your life. It removes the stress from your life. It enables you to live as God wants you to live, faithfully obeying His commands and receiving His promises. Well, come back, Tom. Let's sing it one more time. He has made me glad. You say, you're going to sing about being glad after talking about money? Yeah, I am because that makes me glad. I love it when we give. It makes me glad. It makes me glad that God has blessed me. 
that God has prospered me, that God has supplied to me, that he's giving seed to this sower. And that seed becomes food for me and a blessing to someone else. Oh, come on, church, sing it out. He has made me glad. Come on, lift up your hands. Lift up your voices. Give him praise. Honor him. For he has made me glad. 